Hi, morning everyone. Um, what I'm going to do, we've got we've got two presentations, and um, the first presentation is being is is for two people. We've got Richard Broughton and Anne Stripe, and also we've got Owen Butler on the line as well, who is going to help with questions from Anne and Richard's presentation. And then following this presentation, will um, Kevin will speak as well. So I'm going to introduce Richard, Anne, and Owen first for this first presentation. Um, so Richard Broughton is a career civil servant and has worked in a variety of roles in HSE for over 30 years, starting out in its laboratories in Sheffield. He moved to policy in the 1990s and has worked on international issues, risk, risk policy, young person safety and occupational health generally. He is currently interim head of the chemicals and radiation team in HSE's health and work branch based in Bootle. And then we've got Anne Stripe joined HSE in 2008, previously working in the private sector. Anne has worked across a number of divisions and is currently a policy advisor in the health and work branch of the engagement and policy division. And Owen. Owen is a principal chemist of 31 years standing within the analytical chemistry team at the HSE Science and Research Centre in Buxton. His research interests lie in the development of new and improved methods for the sampling analysis of chemical agents in workplace air and such work has been disseminated through publication of national, European and international standards. So that's you three. If you want to um, start and I'll introduce Kevin before Kevin's presentation. So over to you, Richard and Anne. OK, yes, excellent. Uh, well, thanks, Alan, for that. And welcome, everybody, to this uh, to this regional uh, webinar. Uh, we, we, thanks to BOHS for inviting us to come and talk to you today. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, that, that's joined this from, as Ellen said, all, all, all over the world. I gather that we've got somebody who's joined uh, from Cape Town. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of scene setting uh, now before the bulk of the presentation is given by my colleague Anne Stribe. Uh, and I hope that at the end of this morning session, that as in the title of the seminar and as in the title of this talk, that you go away with some reassurance that indeed all's well and that ends well. I would certainly hope that you don't go away thinking it's all been much ado about nothing uh, or, God forbid, a comedy of errors. Uh, and we cannot quite give you the complete works because this is very much work in progress, but we hope to give you a good update of where we've come from. Uh, where we are and where we are going. So, Anne, if you could just put up uh, the next slide, please. This is a snapshot in time of where we are. As I've just said, this is this is work in progress. There's a lot of work being done and there's a lot of work to do as we move towards a GB system for, for workplace exposure limits. But Anne will cover this in quite a lot more detail. But what we want to ensure as we uh, progress this work is that any uh, exposure limits in this country in GB will be achievable, feasible and crucially um, protective of health. Uh, the process that we would develop would absolutely include a review of uh, scientific data and evidence as well as an economic analysis of the impact and as appropriate we would see to external peer review through uh, relevant scientific experts. Naturally there will be a consultation with stakeholders, no doubt a full public consultation and any future decision would ultimately be taken at the policy level by the HSE board. So very much as what has gone previously, but we want to absolutely ensure that that that, that, that is mirrored so far as we can as we as we move forward. So having set that scene and having set, I guess, to some extent the expectations, can I now hand over to my colleague Anne, who will go through this in, in uh, a little bit more detail. Good morning, everybody. So my name's Anne Stripe and I work with Richard in the policy team and HSC and I'll be responsible for taking this work on the new well regime forward. So as many of you are aware, the UK was previously part of the EU system for setting exposure limits designed to protect workers from the effects of hazardous substances. Sorry, somebody muted me. <laughs> the EU introduced exposure limits through implementation of amendments to the Carcinogens and Mutagens Directive and the indicative occupational exposure limit values are set under the Chemical Agents Directive. 
Now, implementation of these directives in GB was achieved through the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations 2002, known as COSH, and this was by the addition or revision of the Workplace Exposure Limits, as we know, known as WELLS, in HSE's publication EH40-2005. Phase 1 of CMD was implemented in January 2020. Following the UK's exit from the EU and the end of the transition period, we're no longer involved in the EU limited setting regime. The EU and UK trade agreements state that each party is free to determine their own approach to good regulatory practice consistent with its own legal framework, practice and procedures. Now, the COSH regulations require adequate control of exposure to all hazardous substances and exposure to carcinogens and asthmogens must be reduced to as low as is reasonably practicable, known as a LARP, and I'll expand on this a little later. Tackling operational ill health remains a key theme of the strategy for the GB health and safety system. An action to reduce the numbers of deaths and cases of ill health from exposure to carcinogens and other hazardous substances are an important element of this. We're now considering options for the long-term model for setting wells in GB. In the interim, we will consider and apply as appropriate those limits that are set under the EU regime that are of significance to GB. We were involved in discussions with the EU working group during the early review of these substances, and we want to focus on those substances that will have the most impact on the reduction of work-related ill health. We are reviewing the outstanding substances to identify those relevant to GB, and these will be categorised. Our proposed approach is to review the outstanding EU substances and categorise them as follows. No action, validation or additional information required, and new or revised limits considered appropriate for introduction in GB. Now, not all outstanding substances will be relevant. For many of the substances in the outstanding phases of CMD, GB already has the same or more stringent limits. The EU introduces skin notation only for some substances and COSH already requires control of exposure via all routes, including the skin. There are also cases where we believe the EU limits proposed will not provide any additional health benefits. And in some cases, there's very little or no known use in GB or where they are used are already controlled well below the proposed limit. Where validation is required, we will engage with sector stakeholders and seek further information as needed. Any future long-term GB model would also focus on those substances where we can have most impact in terms of reducing cases of occupational ill health and will consider where relevant limits set outside of GB. Any proposals will be based on a review of scientific data and evidence and an economic analysis and independent expert advice would also be sought on any proposals. We will of course continue to consult with stakeholders on any new or revised limits to be introduced in GB. Any methodology approach we follow will continue to be robust and this would identify and select relevant recent reviews of health hazards and other data to support decisions on revising or setting new limits. It would assess data covering a standard set of health endpoints and assess available occupational exposure data and the feasibility of control options. It would determine suitable measurement methods, develop a, pros, would develop a proposed value for a well with associated notation and biological monitoring guidance values if appropriate. The information on the substance to be assembled and assessed would include the physical and chemical properties and measurement approaches, the occurrence, production and use of the chemical agent, health related data, whether or not a threshold can be established, workplace exposure routes and exposure levels, feasible methods of control and biological monitoring data. If a threshold has been established, it may be possible to propose a health based value for a well. Where a threshold cannot be determined from the available data, 
or the analysis of the hazards and data indicates that there's no threshold, then the well will be set as a risk-based exposure level considered to be reasonably practicable in GB workplaces. All this information will be analysed and pulled together into a proposal report. This would then be reviewed by the Workplace Health Expert Committee, known as WEC, who would act as the independent scientific expert to validate our findings and proposals. In some cases, the outcome of a review of a substance may result in a decision not to introduce or revise a GB well. It's often through doing the work to set or revise the limit the HSE finds information that allows it to identify if another type of intervention will be more appropriate. Therefore, HSE may propose other controls or options or interventions instead of or in addition to a well. An example of this is welding fume. In 2019, new scientific evidence revealed that exposure to all welding fume, including mild steel welding fume, can cause cancer and this resulted in a change to HSE's enforcement expectations. Now, although welding fume has never been assigned a well, this does not stop employers or inspectors understanding what good control and a LARP looks like in practice. HSE has provided guidance on achieving adequate control of exposure of welding fume, and this is available in the form of the new mobile phone friendly microsite, COSH essential sheets, operational guidance, and in the supporting inspector refresher training materials for internal use. If a new or revised well is the outcome of a review, HSE would then follow normal standard procedure and conduct an economic impact assessment and run a full public consultation. Setting exposure limits is a policy-led project, but it brings together the best available evidence, analysis and operational intelligence. And as previously, the decision on any action to be taken will be made by the HSE board. The HSE board is made up of a tripartite group, and this includes employee, employer and government representation. We will also continue our engagement with the UK REACH team, ensuring regular meetings to keep each other informed and to share information on substances being considered under the two regimes. The current legal framework in GB will continue to ensure that standards of protection for those working with hazardous substances are maintained. HSE has a robust and well-established regulatory framework in place to protect workers from health risks associated with exposure to hazardous substances in the workplace, and this is through the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations, known as COSH. Under COSH, employers have a duty to prevent or control work of exposure to hazardous substances. Wells form part of COSH and are set for some hazardous substances. Wells must not be exceeded and for carcinogens and asthmogens, exposure must be as low as is reasonably practicable, or ALARP. ALARP means improving controls until the cost of any further reductions in exposure becomes grossly disproportionate when weighed against the predicted benefits. So in practice, this means that if technically achievable and cost effective controls that can further reduce exposure are available, then HXC expects these to be provided. For example, flower dust, one of the main causes of asthma in GB, currently has an eight hour time weighted average well of 10 milligrams per cubic metre. However, HSE believe that by applying the principles of good control, in most cases, exposures can be reduced to around two to four milligrams per cubic metre. And this is what they would expect to see when out on inspection. In the absence of a well or where a hazardous substance is not categorised as a carcinogen or asthmogen, the COSH principles of good practice must be applied. This includes reducing exposure proportionate to the health risk until the cost becomes disproportionate, and so in effect is a very similar requirement to ALARP. The principles of good practice also apply for those substances produced as a byproduct of mixing or process generated during a working process, for example, wood dust created during drilling and sawing and other woodworking processes, or chromium-6 released during welding. Wells are only one part of the picture. A key element of COSH is good exposure control. 
a risk assessment must be undertaken to determine the health hazards of the substance being used, the potential routes and likely extent of exposure, and the potential health risks from exposure. Based on the outcome of the risk assessment, adequate control measures must be put in place and used correctly. They must be checked and tested at regular intervals, and they must be maintained and kept in efficient working order. Exposure monitoring must be carried out where identified by the risk assessment and health surveillance must be provided where appropriate. Now, these are the things our inspectors will be looking at during inspections. A typical workplace inspection can include looking for observational evidence of poor control, for example, dust on surfaces or in the air, visible uncontrolled mist or fume and buildup of contaminants. Inspectors may also carry out simple tests with smoke tubes or a dust lamp to strengthen identification of an inappropriate local exhaust ventilation system. There is an abundance of guidance and support available. We have the COSH Essentials Sheets, the COSH e-tool, web guidance, mobile friendly microsites, a telephone app, example risk assessments and a number of case studies and HSC also continues to carry out frequent, targeted and proactive health inspection campaigns and sector specific initiatives based on its ongoing health strategy. Those doing a risk assessment and following the relevant COSH guidance and essential sheets and using appropriate and properly maintained controls correctly are likely controlling exposure adequately. Thank you for listening. This concludes our presentation and any questions will be answered at the end of the session. I'll hand you back. Thanks, Anne. Um, just asking a quick question. Is everyone, can everyone see the chat box? Because at the start of the presentation, it was muted. And I don't know if anyone has asked any questions or anything. It seems to be working now. But if, if it wasn't before, um, you might want to retype your question in if if there is anything. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say about that. I think it's working now anyway, which is good. Um, I am going to introduce Kevin now. Um, Kevin is CEO, CEO of BOHS. He's a formula, former professor of public law and has advised extensively on liability in the field of the health sciences. He's visiting professor of business and law at the University of Gloucester. So over to you, Kevin. Hello, and if I can just share my screen. You can see that. Right. Yep, I can see that. Um, You're a bit quiet though, Kevin. I don't know if you sorry. can turn your mic off. Can you, can you hear me better now? Yeah. You've got the full presentation as in your full screen on rather than just the presentation. I don't know if you wanted to change that or not. Sorry, sorry I'm just having a little bit of technical difficulties. So not a great advert, is it? I do apologise. OK. Um, am I back on full screen? I'm just doing this. Um, the presentation by HSE sort of highlights um, the fantastic work that is being done by HSE as our regulator in ensuring that there is a sort of a fundamental set of safeguards in place that the state provides. Um, what I'm going to talk about is hopefully something that of, of practical interest to occupational hygienists as a result of the changes that um, HSE are trying to manage themselves. Is my, uh, is my uh, presentation actually showing at the moment? Um, you've yeah, still got yeah. your full screen, as in your, you know, your banners for PowerPoint as well. It's not just... Right, okay, yeah. You can click on the presentation mode. Yeah, yeah presentation mode, that's... Apologies, right, I think I'm okay. So 
Um, what I'm going to talk about is basically how the changes um, that have brought about um, the work that HSC is doing um, affect not the liability to, to um, in terms of HSC, but civil liability. So this is the potential for um, employers to be sued in the civil courts as opposed to be taken to task by HSE. And Sorry, Kevin, we've only got your last slide on the screen still. It's not the first one. It's still on the normal mode, not presentation mode. I and we've got the last slide. Sorry. I do not know. What is That's the first slide. We've got that. Can you see that? I can see the first slide, yeah. And not the banner. It's not in presentation mode, but we can see your first slide. One more go and then please. can you see that? Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's oh, it. Fantastic. Awesome. I do apologize. So. Um, so civil liability, I think a lot of consultants that that I speak to say that their clients are not really worried about the prospect of being sued. Um, this isn't an immediate concern for them. They're more concerned about compliance with HSE, and often that's about compliance with well, if there is a well, um, rather than anything else. And that, that sort of sounds a bit brutal, but it is it is a line that I I sort of get. And this is based on the idea that you know there's an immediate difficulty with HSE, which is HSE can be disruptive um, if you're not being legally compliant. There's a personal risk to directors and managers. And it's seen that compliance with HSE is an immediate threat, and that is a good thing. Um, it is a good thing that people take HSE seriously. Um, however, part of that is because the way in which HSE has worked and the way in which Europe has worked has removed the need for people to rely quite so much on the civil law. Um, the civil law is basically when someone else takes you to court rather than the state. And this is something that is going to change and it's going to change for a variety of reasons and it's going to have an impact on consultants. So wells changing is a symptom of change in the broader legal sphere. Um, so consultants in particular or employed hygienists who fail to advise clients what actually constitutes a factual or scientific standard of minimum acceptable exposure or, or maximum acceptable exposure based on current scientific knowledge, either way will be immediately liable to clients for any costs in remediation. So if you give a client the wrong information about what medical science says, and they work upon that basis and then they subsequently have to change tack because they're sued or because they realize that you you possibly haven't given them all the information necessary you as a, as a consultant or an advisor are directly liable even if nobody's been harmed now that's not a major change because obviously if you give negligent advice you're always liable but there's all, the, the existence of wells, the existence of, of the sort of European regime has, if you like, insulated people from that to a certain extent. Um, and that, that means that there's a need for an understanding of the difference between civil liability and criminal liability and regulatory liability. So HSE, as we all know, is a regulator. They have regulatory and criminal powers to interfere with private rights of employers, to sort of say employers need to do things etc. Um, the thing about being a regulator is that the, a regulator has to be strictly limited and you will notice the real care which Alice took to sort of be very precise etc because you know as a public lawyer we know that it's actually easier to sue public bodies because they have to do everything in the right way and be sort of letter perfect. In civil liability there's a little bit more sort of flexibility here. Um, and the courts have gradually extended the level to which employers can be held to account for exposure of workers. So 
employers who act unlawfully in how they expose work, workers to, to um, hazards. So, for example, they don't use a standard that is recognised by the industry as being good, are liable for the foreseeable health risks if they can show that there's been an absence of care. Once upon a time, this would have been a problem for the future, you know, latency of disease, etc. The most serious disease is not um, manifesting themselves until later in life. However, this is changing. We get earlier diagnosis. You'll have probably heard yesterday about you no know, blood tests to de detect early onset of, of rare cancers. Um, there's now no requirement to prove that there is a direct causal link between a particular employer and a harmful exposure. So even if you can't show that the current employer is the person who sort of exposed someone to a risk that subsequently re results in an Ill illness, the current employer can be the one who's left carrying the can. And the other thing that has developed in recent years is the notion of prospective expenses. So not just sort of saying what you've paid out and what harm you've had, but what the cost will be in the future. And this is a principle that allows the courts to say, well, you've been diagnosed now and it's it's likely that you're going to need medical care, you're going to need support. And we're going to basically say that your future expenses need to be covered by any claim. So why why has this got anything to do with Wells? Well, things have been changing. So prior to 2013, life was fairly easy for um, lawyers. If you could show there was a breach of cost, you you could go to court in a civil claim and you could fairly easily show that there was liability for an employer. In 2013, that link was broken um, so that an employer could wasn't directly liable um, in civil courts if they had breached cost, they, you'd have to prove negligence unless the person who is the worker who is making the claim worked for a public sector body. So up until Brexit came in, into effect, if you worked in the public sector and you um, were subject to an exposure that was a result of a breach of direct, a European directive, you could still sort of just go straight straight to court and say there's a breach of European directive by employers of public sector uh, body and therefore they're acting unlawfully, um, hand us the money. And it's relatively easy transaction. Private sector workers had to use principles of negligence. Um, it is often the case that there is better unionisation, there's better support for public sector workers and there's more of a likelihood of settlement. So subsequent to Brexit, all public sector workers and private sector workers will now, if they want to claim in civil law for compensation for being exposed to illness, they will need to use the same route. And that means you've got a whole load of people who are now going to need to use the civil courts to establish liability at a time when establishing liability is getting easier. Um, so wells will no longer be a reliable basis for employers to determine whether or not they are going to get sued now or later. And this means that occupational hygienists need to be changing their message to a certain extent to empl employers not only highlighting, as they always should, their regulatory liability, but employers should also be aware that they have civil law duties and the likelihood of getting sued is going to go up exponentially. And merely complying with regulatory limits in this country is not going to be enough. There will, so this the basis of liability will be based on factual and scientific knowledge within the industry. And that the defences that you know, you've, you kind of been compliant, the inferred defence that you've been compliant with Wells will not no longer really be one that will wash, even if, if it did in certain circumstances in certain cases. So all employers was kind of under a duty to use you no know, state of the art technology 
the excuse of cost benefit analysis, um, which is the ALARP defence, is not one that is immediately available in terms of civil liability because the benefit analysis is, is balancing the duty of care against the cost of the harm to the individual. So what's a safe limit to protect against litigation in civil cases? If the employers considered the maximum possible exposure of any employee and rightly satisfied themselves that there's no appreciable risk that at that level they could contract a disease, they're probably sort of safe. So whether there's a risk at that level is a question of scientific fact, not of, of whether or not you complied with a well or anything else. Um, any employer who uses a substance and process which may result in an illness if the worker is exposed, has a duty of care to understand the, the risks inherent in those substances and processes, regardless of anything on a regulatory basis. So if they're using a rare, new or unique substance, then they still have to understand it and use state-of-the-art techniques. The employer will be liable if that limit is broken and the worker contracts the related disease, even if you can't show the actual incidence of exposure or that that particular employer was responsible. And that an OH who doesn't advise of the point at which exposure might activate illness may also be liable. So in summary, the situation in relation to civil liability is likely to change. Um, as a lawyer, one of the things that you always like is you like change and uncertainty because change and uncertainty gives rise the opportunity for individuals uh, within the legal profession to make their names, to, to look for loopholes and to look for exceptions. In this area of law, the change is such that because of the declining number of, of cases in terms of asbestos, there are some very, very good lawyers who are looking for new areas of, for litigation. There's some further detail of, of this in the article I provided in the Exposure magazine, but the overall message that I'd like to say is that whereas occupational hygienists might have had civil liability sort of at the back of their minds, but not really worrying about it, Occupational hygienists really need to be awake to the standard and duty of care in civil law as well as the regulatory levels. That's not to say that HSE is not setting levels that are hugely beneficial to society and hugely appropriate. Um, but what it is to say is that you cannot assume that if HSE says it's OK, your client is not going to get sued. And that's it for me. OK, well, thank, thank you, Kevin. Um, it's, it's good to have a, a CEO who's also got, got a legal background as well, who can contribute sort of technically to our discussions as well. So that's, that's fantastic. And it's also great, of course, to have HSE's uh, take on this sort of new, new landscape we're entering. It's a very, very hot topic, I think. Right, so in terms of questions, I haven't seen many coming up in the chat, but I, I think if you've got a question, can you either type it in or put, put your hand up? I'm not, I'm not very good at looking out for hands. And so, so maybe Lee and Helen, anyone can, can help me and see if anybody yeah. has. No one's put the hand up at the moment, but if you want to put your hand up and ask a verbal question, just put your hand yes, up so and then um, I now. think Lee can unmute you then to yes, ask, but otherwise put in the chat box. Um, yeah. What I'm going to do, I've got a few questions that arrived on email that I will type in the chat box. Um, and then we can be answering that. Otherwise, we'll just give it a few minutes. Um, Adrian on the chat has just said that Mike Slater had his hand up earlier. So if you want to ask anything, Mike, um, put your hand up again or put it in the chat box, please. But in the meantime, I'm just going to type in the questions that I've received earlier. Um, we'll just wait. You've got a question, Kevin. 
Do you want to, see to, that, John Kerry? Do you want to um, ask the questions, um, Lee, while I type in the other questions that I've got? Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. So this one's for you, Kevin. Cool. Um, what do you mean by reasonably uh, for us illness arising from carcinogens? Is it a risk of one in 100,000 risk or something else? That's from, reasonable, uh, for, for, reasonably foreseeable, I think he's saying. Yeah. So, so, reasonable, ah. so reasonable foreseeability is not based on any kind of statistical prediction. It's based on a kind of a, a, of a more narrative standard and the reasonable foreseeability tests tend to base, are based upon the notion that if you, if you took a person of, of, of an organisation of the same standing as the person who's being sued and you put yourself in that situation with, with the information that they should have had available to them if they were being suitably diligent could they have said that that this is something that could happen so it's a hypothetical test which is applied after the event so you can't sort of sit there and say at the at the particular time you know is it re reasonably foreseeable now that some someone's going to suffer from an illness um, the test is a wise after the event test of the the judge in effect putting themselves in the in the position of the decision maker and saying well could they or should they have seen that this is going to arise um, reasonable foreseeability is, is an objective test so it's not based upon you know what the person was it's based upon you know, the judge sort of creating a hypothetical person who was fully apprised of all of the information and sort of putting themselves. So it's a classic application of hindsight. Can you sort of say whether something's reasonable, reasonably foreseeable in the moment? The answer is only if you make sure that you're properly apprised of all of the information. So it's um, it's it's a test after the event and this is the thing about civil liability unless you do all unless you take reasonable care and apprise yourself of all of the information at the time you can never be in a situation where you sort of can uh, remove the liability that could be imposed after the event so kevin i guess it's a little bit like the sort of the sort of negligence type test isn't it what would a reasonable person in this case, it's, it's a reasonable expert, I suppose. In this case, yeah, absolutely. It's it is it. This is liability and negligence, and that the test is was it reasonable, and foreseeable, and and have you met the standard of care? Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I'll move on to the next one. Then. So Helen's just been putting them in the chat there. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them. Um, is there a plan to implement the BOELs from CMD4 and subsequent directives without review? Or will there be a further scientific review by UK groups, i.e. will the RAC, WPC or ACSH opinion be accepted without question? So I'm not sure who that goes to. Hi, it's Anne here. I've just put a little answer in the box for that. So all the outstanding substances from CMD will be considered and this will be based on the information that's available to us. Um, and as I mentioned, we were involved in some of the early discussions at European level. Now, what we're going to do is we'll look to introduce only those substances um, that are of an interest to GB workers. So we will review um, the outcome of the WPC um, and the um, discussions that have gone on and the RAC and ECHA opinions, but we'll make our own decision based on where we think it's appropriate for GB. Yeah, I think there's a follow-up question as well, as well though, and isn't Anne about uh... UK version of REACH have a clear interface with COSH? Yeah, we, we have regular update meetings with our colleagues on the UK REACH team and we have discussions on the various chemicals that we're reviewing under the separate regime to make sure that there's no overlap and um, so we can discuss where we think is the right place and the right regime for them to sit under. Great. And Kevin, we've got uh, another one for yourself. Uh, would the change in law mean there could be civil cases challenging NHS guidance being used for masks, etc.? So, 
sorry, having a problem toggling the mute button. Um, so if we're talking about liability for COVID, um, so COVID is almost unique in that there is an indemnity um, in place in the Coronavirus Act. Exactly how far that indemnity leads um, is hard to tell. But uh, it, because there's an indemnity there, it doesn't mean that you're not liable. It just means that the government will pay out rather than having to have lit litigation in place. Um, in other circumstances, there's a, there's intense discussion about liability for COVID um, and particularly long COVID as a sort of a potential chronic disease. Um, it falls at a, a a bad time. Some of you will know that there's been successful litigation for the by the Independent Workers Union against um, various government agencies around availability of PPE. That's a public law case based on European principles. So there's still some outstanding European obligations for employers um, in the public sector. But at the same time, these these sort of post um, Brexit uh, considerations uh, will start kicking in as well. So the post Brexit considerations are, are if you like, behavioural things, how lawyers will behave as opposed to direct changes in the law. But um, the, I think we will see a, a significant amount of litigation coming out of COVID, probably in the public sector um, first and then latterly in the private sector in small pockets. It's very hard to litigate COVID because of this Obviously, it's a public health and a, a pandemic um, exposure as opposed to an in work exposure. Uh, another one for you, Kevin. Um, is this change likely to drive up the intensity with the tests for what constitutes occupational illness and historical exposure related events? I.e., I can see a lot more combative activity between the litigant and the defendant entity. Absolutely. The, 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 the effect of the changes in 2013, um, which moved things away from just using effectively um, the HSE standards as proxies, has been to sort of start sort of energising uh, lawyers to come up with new ways of fighting cases. Um, and that's both the defence and the um, claimant side. So we are likely to see more uncertainty. We are likely to see more things going on to appeal. So longer periods of time before we get, get legal certainty. And we're likely to see, yes, intensity. And we possibly will see a phenomenon that we, we already see in terms of asbestos. Asbestos is treated almost like a, a special case, but I think we may see substances that have their own little rules developing um, and so that there are specific levels of liability or specific rules that arise out of particular substances or particular types of exposures. It's going to be very, it's going to be very interesting. I'm going to see lots of rich lawyers. That's what I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just have a look now. So, um, I don't know, Anne, if you want to um, go through the question that you've just answered in the in the chat box at all, the one that you, you replied to to Sarah on. Is there anything you want to expand on that? And Hi, yes, yeah, sure. So Sarah's asked based on um, previous answer, what is expected? Um, sorry, it's moving up the scroll bar. What's the expected timeline for HSE to consider the outstanding limits um, as the approved CMD waive is due this year? OK, so the review of the outstanding substances is currently underway and we hope to have this complete by the end of the year. We need to do some validation with stakeholders on our um, decisions and conclusions on the review of the substances. Um, we then will need to go to the HSE board who make the final decision on any proposals we make for any introduction of a revised or GB, um, a revised or new GB well. And as you know, we're no longer tied to Europe, so we don't need to introduce any new or revised limits to the EU timelines. We can actually introduce those to our own timelines. Thank you. And then there's another one for you as well. Um, will the HSE use the existing priority list provided by WPC to ECHA for establishing new wells? 
OK, so we would potentially look at and consider this, um, but our priority list will come from various routes. So that will be intelligence and information from our um, internal inspectors um, and our specialists. It will come from those on the ground who know that there's issues out there and it would be based on the data and the evidence available to us. So that would be part of the consideration, but only only a small part. Thank you. And then there's one that's come in. Um, Helen, with the one that you sent in that's um, a rather a long paragraph, yeah. what I might do is when I collate all the, the Q&A from this section, I'll um, I'll put that in and we'll make sure to get that answered before that document goes out to everybody. Yeah, I suspect yeah. that quite a lot of that's been answered anyway, but I thought I'd put it on. I think Richard's going to speak, actually. Go on, Richard. Well, yeah, I, I was just going to come on that, uh, come in on that because I, 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 I saw it come through and uh, and as I've said in the chat, I can give a few uh, immediate thoughts on it, uh, uh, on the complexity of caution and other things, uh, but I won't give you a, a, an answer. I think one one, one thing I, I would know is, 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 is that not news to HSE, and it's not news with respect to any reg set of regulations generally. Um, regulations vary in complexity and uh, approaches to compliance and people's understanding of them vary as well. I mean, what I, what I would say, um, the landscape that we're in now post Brexit uh, en enables us to uh, perhaps think a little bit more about the regulatory landscape and the framework and its architecture than, 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 than previous. Um, I think, as we know, a lot of the regulations that are uh, that are on statute at the moment come from relevant uh, EU directives, and that's fine. Um, what they do is they build on the general duties that are in the Health and Safety at Work Act, which itself has general duties uh, uh, or is built on through general duties in the management regulations from an EU uh, directive. But, you know, nonetheless, there are other approaches uh, to uh, ensuring good compliance than just regulations. There is a place for good practice guidance. Uh, uh, there is a place for a poop codes of practice. There, are, uh, there is a place for all sorts of other what we might uh, term regulatory interventions. Regulation is not just legislation. So I think the, 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 it's not an answer to the question, but you know, some some thoughts, I guess, is that yeah, we understand this. Um, it's certainly something that has occurred to me, having taken on on this chemicals brief, uh, you know, quite quite recently. There is a lot of stuff out there on chemicals, and one does wonder whether whether there is a, a you know a, a review in the pipeline, or at least uh, some rationalisation that that could usefully be, be be considered. But yeah, point taken. Excellent. If there's nothing uh, to follow on from that, thank you very much. Uh, we'll just see. We'll give it another couple of minutes to see if there's any other questions coming through. Um, maybe you can also raise your hand if you want to ask anything verbally, but uh, just type away in the meantime. I've just got a quick one for everybody who's on the line. Um, for future BOHS meetings, if anyone's ever got any ideas of things that they would like to be covered or indeed present on, then please let us know as well. That's all for me. <laughs> uh, we did just get a question there as well. Uh, do HSE have any plans to review the limit for asbestos? Um. Oh, don't let me come in there. My answer to that is I shall have to take that under an advisement and talk to my asbestos policy colleagues. Uh, I don't know, unless anyone is from HSE on this call and can take off their BOHS app, put their HSE app and give an answer. Um, I think we'll answer that post meeting. We'll just give it another couple of minutes again, just see if anything comes through. Um, if we do, if you do think of any questions um, once the webinar is over, please, uh, if you reply to the email that I sent that had the link on it, I can pass it on to the speakers. And like I say, we'll put together a big Q&A document that goes out with the recording of this webinar, hopefully um, end of play tomorrow, I would have thought. I think some of the questions might um, take a bit more answering, might they? So they might be circulated later than tomorrow, I would imagine. Um, oh, someone's got their hand up. Yep. So I will. Um, so Dave, are you unmuted there? If you want to, if you want to ask a question. Yeah. Thanks. Just uh, on a comment from I think it was Anne about 
uh, reviewing the CMD4 uh, substances, saying that they would be evaluated based on the impact for GB. So who who will be involved with that discussion to see whether you know you know benzene, nickel, acrylonitrile, what the impact will be for industry and whether industry can have a an opportunity to to uh, comment and uh, an influence on that. Hi, yes. So we will be talking to stakeholders and um, those that are impacted by these specific substances. Uh, we'll also be going by the intelligence that we've got within HSC and the information from our specialists. Um, by various measurements that we have available to us. But but I think the real answer to your question is, yeah, we will definitely be working with sector stakeholders. And we've already got some um, contacts in from when they provided information for the EU impact assessment. OK, thanks. I think Mike's got his hand up, Mike's later. Yeah, I just... Uh... I can't seem to unmute him, so I don't know. Can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted myself. Ah, there you go. Um, apologies for this, but I've had some technical problems, so I might have missed, and I've not been able to access the chat. And <laughs> so um, I'm afraid I, I don't understand how what the mechanism is now for the limits. I mean, it might have been mentioned while I was having the problem, so. Uh, but I think I'd like to go away from this meeting understanding who is actually going to be setting the limits, what body, what committee is going to be doing that. OK, um, I, I, I'll just come in on that. I think actually you might have missed it in the presentation. It is in the presentation that HSE, HSE did give. Ultimately, as uh, any, any limits will be agreed uh, and signed off by the HSC board, uh, which is pretty much the process as it was uh, previously. To get to that stage, it will involve a review by uh, relevant uh, specialists uh, of, of scientific data and other evidence. It will involve an economic analysis of the impact by HSE uh, economist, it will be uh, that will be gathered in, in consultation, and all this will be done in in uh, through consultation as appropriate with relevant external uh, but, stakeholders. Uh, but I did, and, I did uh, can I just interject though, because I did yeah, get of course that. you can. Um, but in the old days, we used to have axe and watch. Have you reconstituted the? Axe and watch because I, I don't understand who's doing all this reviewing that's going to end up with the stuff going to the HSE board. So we now have the workplace health, or oh, I can't read. Anne, can you come in and give the exact name of the acronym? Workplace Health Expert Committee. Is that correct? WEC, I think. Yeah, the Workplace Health yeah. Expert Committee will validate our findings, but our findings will be done by um, HSE specialists. So we've got various specialisms um, that will look at the information and data that's available to us. Um, that will be what we have in house. That will be from what's available from EU, but not just the EU wider across the world. So what we have available to us from America, Canada, and also based on the, the ill health data. Um, so where we can see where the real significant issues are arising. Um, and who's who's on WEC? Uh, the WEC's quite a, a large committee, so there's a number of people on WEC, and I can't quite answer at the moment exactly who will be sitting on the board that will validate our findings. And um, but that has already been agreed. Um, if we do go down this route, that they will look at what we, what our proposals are, and give us their feedback and validation on that information. Okay, thanks. Then there was another question uh, that came in during that conversation. Um, is the HSE giving any particular consideration for endocrine disruptors or planning on setting limits? Well, I'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, at the moment our focus is on the outstanding substances and then looking at developing the GB model. So that's something that we'd need to give further consideration to, but we can get back to you on that. Thank you again. So again, we'll give it another minute or two um, if we get to get to the hour. Um, like I say, you can just email in any questions afterwards um, and we can yeah, forward them on to the speakers.
I'll give it another 30 seconds just to see if anybody's typing. Duncan's just posted a, a link to, to WEC for anyone who's, who wants to find out more, I think. Uh, well, should, we, should we wrap it up there, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think we probably, yeah, I think we probably run its course now. Um, so yeah, but very, very, so very relevant topic, very, very sort of a, a very, very, very hot topic. I think it's still a lot of working process, of course, progress as we try and sort of decouple from the EU and, and develop our own, own approaches. But um, yeah, big, big, big appreciation to all our speakers today for the, all their preparation and, and presentation. Um, thank you to me for, for, for running around and keeping us, keeping us on track. <laughs> So virtual round of applause for everybody. Um, thanks and thanks all for joining. Uh, we, we haven't got any future meetings scheduled as yet um, for any of the regions, but obviously we'll, we'll keep you posted. I think in and over our region in London, we'd we quite like to get, go back to a face-to-face -face meeting sometime. We were talking about possibly doing it by the end of the year, but that, that of course does depend yeah. on depends on all, the all venue. sorts of issues, yeah, end of venue, yeah. and of course but any any COVID restrictions that, uh, that might or might not come back. So I think. Uh, on that Remember note, to send in any to questions if you think of any, and yep, um, Lee will circulate them. Great. Thank you very much. So, thanks again yeah. to all the speakers, speakers can just uh... stay on the line though before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, lovely. Thank you. Thank you.